Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we have part three of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Lord Henry Wotton has taken the impressionable Dorian under his wing and set him to thinking. The painting of him captured him at his finest, most beautiful and pure. It will stay like that forever, whereas he will grow old and weary. If only it could be the other way around. But there is no time for introspection when Lord Henry is about to take Dorian on a hedonistic tour of Victorian London. It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part three of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Chapter 3 At half past twelve next day, Lord Henry Wotton strolled from Curzon Street over to the Albany to call on his uncle, Lord Fermor, a genial, if somewhat rough-mannered old bachelor, whom the outside world called selfish because it derived no particular benefit from him, but who was considered generous by society as he fed the people who amused him. His father had been our ambassador at Madrid when Isabella was young and prim unthought of, but had retired from the diplomatic service in a capricious moment of annoyance on not being offered the embassy at Paris, a post to which he considered that he was fully entitled by reasons of his birth, his indolence, the good English of his dispatches, and his inordinate passion for pleasure. The son, who had been his father's secretary, had resigned along with his chief, somewhat foolishly, as was thought at the time, and on succeeding some months later to the title, had set himself to the serious study of the great aristocratic art of doing absolutely nothing. He had two large townhouses, but preferred to live in chambers, as it was less trouble, and took most of his meals at his club. He paid some attention to the management of his collieries in the Midland counties, excusing himself for his taint of industry on the ground that the one advantage of having coal was that it enabled the gentleman to afford the decency of burning wood in his own hearth. In politics, he was a Tory, except when the Tories were in office, during which period he roundly abused them for being a pack of radicals. He was a hero to his valet, who bullied him, and a terror to most of his relations, whom he bullied in turn. Only England could have produced him, and he always said that the country was going to the dogs. His principles were out of date, but there was a good deal to be said for his prejudices. When Lord Henry entered the room, he found his uncle sitting in a rough shooting coat, smoking a cheroot and grumbling over the times. "'Well, Harry,' said the old gentleman, "'what brings you out so early? "'I thought you dandies never got up until two "'and were not visible until five. "'Pure family affection, I assure you, Uncle George. "'I want to get something out of you.' "'Money, I suppose,' said Lord Fermor, making a wry face. "'Well, sit down and tell me all about it. "'Young people nowadays imagine that money is everything.' "'Yes,' murmured Lord Henry, settling his buttonhole in his coat. "'And when they grow older, they know it. "'But I don't want money. "'It is only people who pay their bills who want that, Uncle George, "'and I never pay mine. "'Credit is the capital of a younger son, and one lives charmingly upon it. "'Besides, I always deal with Dartsmoor's tradesmen, "'and consequently they never bother me. "'What I want is information. "'Not useful information, of course, useless information.' "'Well, I can tell you anything that is in an English blue book, Harry, "'although those fellows nowadays write a lot of nonsense. "'When I was in the diplomatic, things were much better, "'but I hear they let them in now by examination. "'What can you expect? "'Examinations, sir, are pure humbug from beginning to end. "'If a man is a gentleman, he knows quite enough. And "'If he is not a gentleman, whatever he knows is bad for him.' "'Mr. Dorian Gray does not belong to blue books, Uncle George,' said Lord Henry languidly. "'Mr. Dorian Gray? Who is he?' asked Lord Fermor, knitting his bushy white eyebrows. "'That is what I have come to learn, Uncle George. Or rather, I know who he is. He is the last Lord Kelso's grandson. His mother was a Devereux, Lady Margaret Devereux. I want you to tell me about his mother. What was she like? Whom did she marry?' You have known nearly everybody in your time, so you might have known her. I am very much interested in Mr. Gray at present. I have only just met him. Kelso's grandson, echoed the old gentleman. Kelso's grandson. 
Of course. I knew his mother intimately. I believe I was at her christening. She was an extraordinarily beautiful girl, Margaret Devereux, and made all the men frantic by running away with a penniless young fellow, a mere nobody, sir, a subaltern in a foot regiment, or something of that kind. Certainly, I remember the whole thing as if it happened yesterday. The poor chap was killed in a duel at Spa a few months after the marriage. There was an ugly story about it. They said Kelso got some rascally adventurer, some Belgian brute, to insult his son-in-law in public. Paid him, sir, to do it. Paid him. And that the fellow spitted his man as if he had been a pigeon. The thing was hushed up, but egad. Kelso ate his chop alone at the club for some time afterward. He brought his daughter back with him, I was told, and she never spoke to him again. Oh, yes, it was a bad business. The girl died, too, died within a year. So she left a son, did she? I had forgotten that. What sort of boy is he? If he is like his mother, he must be a good-looking chap. He is very good-looking, assented Lord Henry. I hope he will fall into proper hands, continued the old man. He should have a pot of money waiting for him if Kelso did the right thing by him. His mother had money, too. All the Selby property came to her through her grandfather. Her grandfather hated Kelso, thought him a mean dog. He was, too. Came to Madrid once when I was there. Egad, I was ashamed of him. The Queen used to ask me about the English noble who was always quarrelling with the cabmen about their fares. They made quite a story of it. I didn't dare show my face at court for a month. I hope he treated his grandson better than he did the Jarvies. I don't know, answered Lord Henry. I fancy that the boy will be well off. He's not of age yet. He has Selby, I know. He told me so. And... His mother was very beautiful. Margaret Devereux was one of the loveliest creatures I ever saw, Harry. What on earth induced her to behave as she did, I could never quite understand. She could have married anybody she chose. Carlington was mad after her. She was romantic, though. All the women of that family were. The men were a poor lot, but egad, the women were wonderful. Carlington went on his knees to her, told me so himself. She laughed at him, and there wasn't a girl in London at the time who wasn't after him. And by the way, Harry, talking about silly marriages, what is this humbug your father tells me about Dartmoor wanting to marry an American? Ain't English girls good enough for him? It is rather fashionable to marry Americans just now, Uncle George. I'll back English women against the world, Harry, said Lord Fermor, striking the table with his fist. The betting is on the Americans. They don't last, I am told, muttered his uncle. A long engagement exhausts them, but they are capital at a steeplechase. They take things flying. I don't think Dartmoor has a chance. Who are people, grumbled the old gentleman. Has she got any? Lord Henry shook his head. American girls are as clever at concealing their parents as English women are at concealing their past, he said, rising to go. They are pork packers, I suppose. I hope so, Uncle George, for Dartmoor's sake. I am told that pork packing is the most lucrative profession in America, after politics. Is she pretty? She behaves as if she was beautiful. Most American women do. It is the secret of their charm. Why can't these American women stay in their own country? They are always telling us that it is a paradise for women. It is. That is the reason why, like Eve, they are so excessively anxious to get out of it, said Lord Henry. Uh, goodbye, Uncle George. I shall be late for lunch if I stop any longer. Thanks for giving me the information I wanted. I always like to know everything about my new friends, and nothing about my old ones. Where are you lunching, Harry? At Aunt Agatha's. I have asked myself and Mr. Gray. He is her latest protégé. Humph. Tell your Aunt Agatha, Harry, not to bother me any more with her charity appeals. I am sick of them. Why, the good woman thinks that I have nothing to do but write checks for her silly fads. All right, Uncle George. I'll tell her, but it won't have any effect. Philanthropic people lose all sense of humanity. It is their distinguishing characteristic. The old gentleman growled approvingly and rang the bell for his servant. Lord Henry passed up the low arcade into Burlington Street and turned his steps in the direction of Berkeley Square. So that was the story of Dorian Gray's parentage. Crudely, as it had been told to him, it had not yet stirred him by its suggestion of a strange, almost modern romance, a beautiful woman risking everything for a mad passion. 
A few wild weeks of happiness cut short by a hideous, treacherous crime. Months of voiceless agony, and then a child born in pain. The mother snatched away by death, the boy left to solitude and the tyranny of an old and loveless man. Yes, it was an interesting background. It posed the lad, made him more perfect, as it were. Behind every exquisite thing that existed, there was something tragic. Worlds had to be in travail, that the meanest flower might blow, and how charming he had been at dinner the night before, as with startled eyes and lips parted in frightened pleasure, he had sat opposite to him at the club, the red candle shades staining to a richer rose the wakening wonder of his face. Talking to him was like playing upon an exquisite violin. He answered to every touch and thrill of the bow. There was something terribly enthralling in the exercise of influence. No other activity was like it. To project one's soul into some gracious form and let it tarry there for a moment. To hear one's own intellectual views echoed back to one with all the added music of passion and youth. To convey one's temperament into another as though it were a subtle fluid or a strange perfume. There was a real joy in that. Perhaps the most satisfying joy left to us in an age so limited and vulgar as our own, an age grossly carnal in its pleasures and grossly common in its aims. He was a marvellous type, too, this lad, whom by so curious a chance he had met in Basil's studio, or could be fashioned into a marvellous type at any rate. Grace was his, and the white purity of boyhood, and beauty such as old Greek marbles kept for us. There was nothing that one could not do with him. He could be made a titan or a toy. What a pity it was that such beauty was destined to fade. And Basil, from a psychological point of view, how interesting he was. The new manner in art, the fresh mode of looking at life, suggested so strangely by the merely visible presence of one who was unconscious of it all. The silent spirit that dwelt in dim woodland and walked unseen in open fields, suddenly showing herself dryad-like and not afraid, because in his soul who sought for her there had been wakened that wonderful vision to which alone are wonderful things revealed, the mere shapes and patterns of things becoming, as it were, refined and gaining a kind of symbolic value, as though they were themselves patterns of some other and more perfect form whose shadow they made real. How strange it all was! He remembered something like it in history. Was it not Plato, that artist in thought, who had first analysed it? Was it not Buonarroti, who had carved it in the coloured marbles of a sonnet sequence? But in our own century, it was strange. Yes, he would try to be to Dorian Gray what, without knowing it, the lad was to the painter who had fashioned the wonderful portrait. He would seek to dominate him had already, indeed, half done so. He would make that wonderful spirit his own. There was something fascinating in this sun of love and death. Suddenly, he stopped and glanced up at the houses. He found that he had passed his aunt some distance, and, smiling to himself, turned back. When he entered the somewhat sombre hall, the butler told him that they had gone in to lunch. He gave one of the footmen his hat and stick, and passed into the dining room. "'Late as usual, Harry,' cried his aunt, shaking her head at him. He invented a facile excuse, and, having taken the vacant seat next to her, looked around to see who was there. Dorian bowed to him shyly from the end of the table, a flush of pleasure stealing into his cheek. Opposite was the Duchess of Harley, a lady of admirable good nature and good temper, much liked by everyone who knew her, and of those ample architectural proportions that in women who are not duchesses are described by contemporary historians as stoutness. Next to her sat on her right Sir Thomas Burden, a radical member of Parliament, who followed his leader in public life, and in private life followed the best cooks, dining with the Tories and thinking with the Liberals, in accordance with the wise and well-known rule. The post on her left was occupied by Mr Erskine of Treadley, an old gentleman of considerable charm and culture, who had fallen, however, into bad habits of silence, having, as he explained once to Lady Agatha, said everything that he had to say before he was thirty. His own neighbour was Mrs. Vandeleur, one of his aunt's oldest friends, a perfect saint amongst women, but so dreadfully dowdy that she reminded one of a badly bound hymn book. Fortunately for him, she had on the other side Lord Fordle, a most intelligent middle-aged mediocrity, as bald as a ministerial statement in the House of Commons, with whom she was conversing in that intensely earnest manner, which is the one unpardonable error, as he remarked once himself, that all really good people fall into, and from which none of them ever quite escape. 
We are talking about poor Dartmoor, Lord Henry, cried the Duchess, nodding pleasantly to him across the table. Do you think he will really marry this fascinating young person? I believe she has made up her mind to propose to him, Duchess. How dreadful, exclaimed Lady Agatha. Really, someone should interfere. I am told on excellent authority that her father keeps an American dry goods store, said Sir Thomas Burden, looking supercilious. My uncle has already suggested pork packing, Sir Thomas. Dry goods? What are American dry goods? asked the Duchess, raising her large hands in wonder and accentuating the verb. American novels, answered Lord Henry, helping himself to some quail. The Duchess looked puzzled. Don't mind him, my dear, whispered Lady Agatha. He never means anything, he says. When America was discovered, said the radical member, and he began to give some wearisome facts. Like all people who try to exhaust a subject, he exhausted his listeners. The Duchess sighed and exercised her privilege of interruption. I wish to goodness that it had never been discovered at all, she exclaimed. Really, our girls have no chance nowadays. It is most unfair. Perhaps, after all, America never has been discovered, said Mr. Erskine. I myself would say that it had merely been detected. Oh, but I have seen specimens of the inhabitants, answered the Duchess vaguely. I must confess that most of them are extremely pretty, and they dress well, too. They get all their dresses in Paris. I wish I could afford to do the same. They say that when good Americans die, they go to Paris, chuckled Sir Thomas, who had a large wardrobe of humours cast off clothes. Really? Where do bad Americans go when they die? inquired the Duchess. They go to America, murmured Lord Henry. Sir Thomas frowned. "'I'm afraid that your nephew is prejudiced against that great country,' he said to Lady Agatha. "'I have travelled all over it in cars provided by the directors, who in such matters are extremely civil. I assure you that it is an education to visit it.' "'But must we really see Chicago in order to be educated?' asked Mr. Erskine plaintively. "'I don't feel up to the journey.' Sir Thomas waved his hand. Mr. Erskine of Treadley has the world on his shelves. We practical men like to see things, not to read about them. The Americans are an extremely interesting people. They are absolutely reasonable. I think that is their distinguishing characteristic. Yes, Mr. Erskine, an absolutely reasonable people. I assure you, there is no nonsense about the Americans. How dreadful, cried Lord Henry. I can stand brute force, but brute reason is quite unbearable. There is something unfair about its use. It is hitting below the intellect. I do not understand you, said Sir Thomas, growing rather red. I do, Lord Henry, murmured Mr. Erskine with a smile. Paradox is all very well in their way, rejoined the baronet. Was that a paradox? asked Mr. Erskine. I did not think so. Perhaps it was. Well, the way of paradoxes is the way of truth. To test reality, we must see it on the tightrope. When the verities become acrobats, we can judge them. Dear me, said Lady Agatha, how you men argue. I'm sure I can never make out what you're talking about. Oh, Harry, I am quite vexed with you. Why do you try to persuade our nice Mr. Dorian Gray to give up the East End? I assure you, he would be quite invaluable. They would love his playing. I want him to play to me, cried Lord Henry, smiling, and he looked down the table and caught a bright answering glance. But they are so unhappy in Whitechapel, continued Lady Agatha. I can sympathise with everything except suffering, said Lord Henry, shrugging his shoulders. I cannot sympathise with that. It is too ugly, too horrible, too distressing. There is something terribly morbid in the modern sympathy with pain. One should sympathise with the colour, the beauty, the joy of life. The less said about life soars, the better. Still, the East End is a very important problem, remarked Sir Thomas with a grave shake of the head. Quite so, answered the young lord. It is the problem of slavery, and we try to solve it by amusing the slaves. The politician looked at him keenly. What change do you propose, then? he asked. Lord Henry laughed. I don't desire to change anything in England, except the weather, he answered. I am quite content with philosophic contemplation. But as the 19th century has gone bankrupt through an over-expenditure of sympathy, I would suggest that we should appeal to science to put us straight. The advantage of the emotions is that they lead us to astray, and the advantage of science is that it is not emotional. But we have such grave responsibilities, ventured Mrs. Vandeleur timidly. "'Terribly grave,' echoed Lady Agatha. Lord Henry looked over at Mr. Erskine. 
Humanity takes itself too seriously. It is the world's original sin. If the cavemen had known how to laugh, history would have been different. You really are very confusing, warbled the Duchess. I have always felt rather guilty when I came to your dear aunt, for I take no interest at all in the East End. For the future, I shall be able to look her in the face without a blush. A blush is very becoming, Duchess, remarked Lord Henry. Only when one is young, she answered. When an old woman like myself blushes, it is a very bad sign. Ah, Lord Henry, I wish you would tell me how to become young again, he thought for a moment. Can you remember of any great error that you committed in your early days, Duchess? he asked, looking at her across the table. A great many, I fear, she cried. Then commit them over again, he said gravely. To get back one's youth, one has merely to repeat one's follies. A delightful theory, she exclaimed. I must put it into practice. Dangerous theory came from Sir Thomas's tight lips. Lady Agatha shook her head, but could not help being amused. Mr. Erskine listened. Yes, he continued, that is one of the great secrets of life. Nowadays, most people die of a sort of creeping common sense and discover when it is too late that the only things one never regrets are one's mistakes. A laugh ran round the table. He played with the idea and grew willful, tossing it in the air and transformed it, let it escape and recaptured it, made it iridescent with fancy and winged it with paradox. The praise of folly, as he went on, soared into a philosophy, and philosophy herself became young, and catching the mad music of pleasure, wearing, one might fancy, her wine-stained robe and wreath of ivy, danced like a bacchanite over the hills of life and mocked the slow Silenus for being sober. Facts fled before her like frightened forest things. Her white feet trod the huge press at which wise Omar sits, till the seething grape juice rose round her bare limbs in waves of purple bubbles, or crawled in red foam over the vat's black, dripping, sloping sides. It was an extraordinary improvisation. He felt like the eyes of Dorian Gray were fixed on him, and the consciousness that amongst his audience there was one whose temperament he wished to fascinate seemed to give his wit keenness and to lead colour into his imagination. He was brilliant, fantastic, irresponsible. He charmed his listeners out of themselves, and they followed his pipe laughing. Dorian Gray never took his gaze off him, but sat like one under a spell, smiles chasing each other over his lips and wonder growing grave in his darkening eyes. At last, liveried in the costume of the age, reality entered the room in the shape of a servant to tell the Duchess that her carriage was waiting. She wrung her hands in mock despair. "'How annoying!' she cried. "'I must go. I have to call for my husband at the club to take him to some absurd meeting in Willis's rooms, where he is going to be in the chair. If I am late, he is sure to be furious, and I couldn't have a scene in this bonnet. It is far too fragile. A harsh word would ruin it. No, I must go, dear Agatha. Goodbye, Lord Henry. You are quite delightful and dreadfully demoralising. I'm sure I don't know what to say about your views. You must come and dine with us some night. Tuesday? Are you disengaged Tuesday? For you, I would throw over anybody, Duchess, said Lord Henry with a bow. Ah, that is very nice and very wrong of you, she cried. So mind you come, and she swept out of the room, followed by Lady Agatha and the other ladies. When Lord Henry had sat down again, Mr Erskine moved round and, taking a chair close to him, placed his hand upon his arm. You talk books away, he said. Why don't you write one? I am too fond of reading books to care for writing them, Mr Erskine. I should like to write a novel, certainly, a novel that would be as lovely as a Persian carpet and as unreal. But there is no literary public in England for anything except newspapers, primers and encyclopedias. Of all the people of the world, the English have the least sense of the beauty of literature. I fear you are right, answered Mr Erskine. I myself used to have literary ambitions, but I gave them up long ago. And now, my dear young friend, if you will allow me to call you so, may I ask if you really meant all that you said to us at lunch? I quite forget what I said, smiled Lord Henry. Was it all very bad? Very bad indeed. In fact, I consider you extremely dangerous, and if anything happens to our good Duchess, we shall all look on you to being primarily responsible. But I should like to talk to you about life. The generation into which I was born was tedious. Some day, when you are tired of London, come down to Treadley and expound to me your philosophy of pleasure over some admirable burgundy I am fortunate enough to possess. I shall be charmed. A visit to Treadley would be a great privilege. It has a perfect host and a perfect library. 
"'You will complete it,' answered the old man with a courteous bow. "'And now I must bid good-bye to your excellent aunt. "'I'm due at the Athenaeum. "'It is the hour when we sleep there.' "'All of you, Mr. Erskine?' Forty of us in forty armchairs. "'We are practising for an English Academy of Letters.' "'Lord Henry laughed and rose. "'I am going to the park,' he cried. "'As he was passing out of the door, Dorian Gray touched him on the arm. "'Let me come with you,' he murmured. "'But I thought you had promised Basil Hallward to go and see him,' answered Lord Henry. "'I would sooner come with you. "'Yes, I feel I must come with you. "'Do let me, and you will promise to talk to me all the time?' No one talks as wonderfully as you do. Ah, I have talked quite enough for today, said Lord Henry, smiling. All I want now is to look at life. You may come and look at it with me, if you care to. Chapter 4 One afternoon, a month later, Dorian Gray was reclining in a luxurious armchair in the little library of Lord Henry's house in Mayfair. It was, in its way, a very charming room, with its high-panelled wainscoting of olive-stained oak, its cream-coloured frieze and ceiling of raised plasterwork, and its brick-dust felt carpet strewn with silk, long-fringed Persian rugs. On a tiny satinwood table stood a statuette by Clodion, and beside it lay a copy of Les Saintes Nouvelles, bound for Margaret of Valois by Clovis Eve, and powdered with the gilt daisies that Queen had selected for her device. Some large blue china jars and parrot tulips were ranged on the mantel shelf, and through the small leaded panes of the windows streamed the apricot-coloured light of a summer day in London. Lord Henry had not yet come in. He was always late, on principle, his principle being that punctuality is the thief of time, so the lad was looking rather sulky as, with listless fingers, he turned over the pages of an elaborately illustrated edition of Manon Lescaut that he had found on one of the bookcases. The formal, monotonous ticking of the Louis XIV clock annoyed him. Once or twice he thought of going away. At last he heard a step outside and the door opened. "'How late you are, Harry,' he murmured. "'I'm afraid it is not Harry, Mr. Gray,' answered a shrill voice. He glanced quickly round and rose to his feet. "'I beg your pardon. I thought... you thought it was my husband. It is only his wife. You must let me introduce myself. I know you quite well by your photographs. I think my husband has got seventeen of them.' "'Not seventeen, Lady Henry. Well, eighteen, then. And I saw you with him the other night at the opera.' She laughed nervously as she spoke and watched him with her vague forget-me-not eyes. She was a curious woman whose dresses always looked as if they had been designed in a rage and put on in a tempest. She was usually in love with somebody, and as her passion was never returned, she had kept all her illusions. She tried to look picturesque, but only succeeded in being untidy. Her name was Victoria, and she had a perfect mania for going to church. That was at Lohengrin, Lady Henry, I think. Yes, it was at Steer Lohengrin. I like Wagner's music better than anybody's. It's so loud that one can talk the whole time without other people hearing what one says. That is a great advantage, don't you think so, Mr. Gray? The same nervous staccato laugh broke from her thin lips, and her fingers began to play with a long tortoise-shell paper knife. Dorian smiled and shook his head. I'm afraid I don't think so, Lady Henry. I'd never talk during music, at least during good music. If one hears bad music, it is one's duty to drown it in conversation. Ah, that is one of Harry's views, isn't it, Mr. Gray? I always hear Harry's views from his friends. It is the only way I get to know of them. But you must not think I don't like good music. I adore it, but I am afraid of it. It makes me too romantic. I have simply worshipped pianists, two at a time sometimes, Harry tells me. I don't know what it is about them. Perhaps it is that they are foreigners. They all are, aren't they? Even those that are born in England become foreigners after a time, don't they? It is so clever of them, and such a compliment to art. Makes it makes it quite cosmopolitan, doesn't it? You have never been to any of my parties, have you, Mr. Gray? You must come. I can't afford orchids, but I spare no expense in foreigners. They make one's rooms look so picturesque. Ah, but here is Harry. Harry, I came in to look for you, to ask for something. I forget what it was. And I found Mr. Gray here. We have had such a pleasant chat about music. We have quite the same ideas. No, I think our ideas are quite different. But he has been most pleasant. I'm so glad I've seen him. "'I'm charmed, my love, quite charmed,' said Lord Henry, elevating his dark, crescent-shaped eyebrows, and looking at them both with an amused smile. "'So sorry I'm late, Dorian. I went to look after a piece of old brocade in Wardour Street, and had to bargain for hours for it. Nowadays people know the price of everything and the value of nothing.' 
I'm afraid I must be going, exclaimed Lady Henry, breaking an awkward silence with her silly sudden laugh. I have promised to drive with the Duchess. Goodbye, Mr. Grey. Goodbye, Harry. You are dining out, I suppose? So am I. Perhaps I shall see you at Lady Thornbury's. I dare say, my dear, said Lord Henry, shutting the door behind her as, looking like a bird of paradise that had been out all night in the rain, she flitted out of the room, leaving a faint odour of frangipani. Then he lit a cigarette and flung himself down on the sofa. Never marry a woman with straw-coloured hair, Dorian, he said after a few puffs. Why, Harry? Because they're so sentimental. But I like sentimental people. Never marry at all, Dorian. Men marry because they're tired. Women because they're curious. Both are disappointed. I don't think I am likely to marry, Harry. I am too much in love. That is one of your aphorisms. I am putting it into practice as I do everything that you say. Who are you in love with? asked Lord Henry after a pause. With an actress, said Dorian Gray, blushing. Lord Henry shrugged his shoulders. That is a rather commonplace debut. You would not say so if you saw her, Harry. Who is she? Her name is Sybil Vane. Never heard of her. No one has. People will some day, however. She is a genius. My dear boy, no woman is a genius. Women are a decorative sex. They never have anything to say, but they say it charmingly. Women represent the triumph of matter over mind, just as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. Harry, how can you? My dear Dorian, it is quite true. I am analysing women at present, so I ought to know. The subject is not so abstruse as I thought it was. I find that ultimately there are only two kinds of women, the plain and the coloured. The plain women are very useful. If you want to gain a reputation for respectability, you have merely to take them down to supper. The other women are very charming. They commit one mistake, however. They paint in order to try and look young. Our grandmothers painted in order to try and talk brilliantly. Rouge and esprit used to go together. That is all over now. As long as a woman can look ten years younger than her own daughter, she is perfectly satisfied. As for conversation, there are only five women in London worth talking to, and two of these can't be admitted to in decent society. However, tell me about your genius. How long have you known her? Harry, your views terrify me. Never mind that. How long have you known her? About three weeks. And where did you come across her? I will tell you, Harry, but you mustn't be unsympathetic about it. After all, it never would have happened if I had not met you. You filled me with a wild desire to know everything about life. For days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. As I lounged in the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to look at everyone who passed me and wonder with a mad curiosity what sort of lives they led. Some of them fascinated me. Others filled me with terror. There was an exquisite poison in the air. I had a passion for sensations. Well, one evening about seven o'clock, I determined to go out in search of some adventure. I felt that this grey monstrous London of ours, with its myriads of people, its sordid sinners, and its splendid sins, as you once phrased it, must have something in store for me. I fancied a thousand things. The mere danger gave me a sense of delight. I remembered what you had said to me on that wonderful evening when we first dined together, about the search for beauty being the real secret of life. I don't know what I expected, but I went out and wandered eastward, soon losing my way in a labyrinth of grimy streets and black grassless squares. About half past eight, I passed by an absurd little theatre with great flaring gas jets and gaudy playbills. A hideous Jew in the most amazing waistcoat I've ever beheld in my life was standing at the entrance smoking a vile cigar. He had greasy ringlets and an enormous diamond blazed in the centre of a soiled shirt. "'Have a box, my lord,' he said when he saw me, and he took off his hat with an air of gorgeous civility. There was something about him, Harry, that amused me. He was such a monster. You will laugh at me, I know, but I really went in and paid a whole guinea for the stage box. To the present day, I can't make out why I did so, and yet if I hadn't, my dear Harry, if I hadn't, I should have missed the greatest romance of my life. I see you are laughing. It is horrid of you. I'm not laughing, Dorian. At least I'm not laughing at you. But you should not say the greatest romance of your life. You should say the first romance of your life. You will always be loved, and you will always be in love with love. A grand passion is the privilege of people who have nothing to do. That is the one use of the idle classes of a country. Don't be afraid. There are exquisite things in store for you. This is merely the beginning. 
Do you think my nature so shallow? cried Dorian Gray angrily. No, I think your nature so deep. How do you mean? My dear boy, the people who love only once in their lives are really the shallow people. What they call their loyalty and their fidelity, I call either the lethargy of custom or their lack of imagination. Faithfulness is to the emotional life what consistency is to the life of the intellect, simply a confession of failure. Faithfulness? I must analyse it some day. The passion for property is in it. There are many things that we would throw away if we were not afraid that others might pick them up. But I don't want to interrupt you. Go on with your story. Well, I found myself seated in a horrid little private box with a vulgar drop scene staring me in the face. I looked out from behind the curtain and surveyed the house. It was a tawdry affair, all cupids and cornucopias like a third-rate wedding cake. The gallery and pit were fairly full, but the two rows of dingy stalls were quite empty, and there was hardly a person in what I suppose they called the dress circle. Women went about with oranges and ginger beer, and there was a terrible consumption of nuts going on. It must have been just like the palmy days of the British drama. Just like, I should fancy, and very depressing. I began to wonder what on earth I should do when I caught sight of the playbill. What do you think the play was, Harry? I should think the idiot boy, or dumb but innocent. Our fathers used to like that sort of piece, I believe. The longer I live, Dorian, the more keenly I feel that whatever was good enough for our fathers is not good enough for us, in art as in politics. Les grands-pères ont toujours tort. This play was good enough for us, Harry. It was Romeo and Juliet. I must admit that I was rather annoyed at the idea of seeing Shakespeare done in such a wretched hole of a place. Still, I felt interested in a sort of way. At any rate, I determined to wait for the first act. There was a dreadful orchestra, presided over by a young man who sat at a cracked piano that nearly drove me away. But at last the drop scene was drawn up and the play began. Romeo was a stout elderly gentleman with corked eyebrows, a husky tragedy voice and a figure like a beer barrel. Mercutio was almost as bad. He was played by the low comedian who had introduced gags of his own and was on most friendly terms with the pit. They were both as grotesque as the scenery, and that looked as if it had come out of a country booth. But Juliet! Harry, imagine a girl, hardly seventeen years of age, with a little flower-like face, a small Greek head with plaited coils of dark brown hair, eyes that were violet wells of passion, lips that were like the petals of a rose. She was the loveliest thing I had ever seen in my life. You said to me once that pathos left you unmoved, but that beauty, mere beauty, could fill your eyes with tears. I tell you, Harry, I could hardly see this girl for the mist of tears that came across me. And her voice! I never heard such a voice. It was very low at first, with deep, mellow notes that seemed to fall singly upon one's ear. Then it became a little louder and sounded like a flute or a distant haunt boy. In the garden scene, it had all the tremulous ecstasy that one hears just before dawn when nightingales are singing. There were moments, later on, when it had the wild passion of violins. You know how a voice can stir one. Your voice and the voice of Sybil Vane are two things I shall never forget. When I close my eyes, I hear them, and each of them says something different. I don't know which to follow. Why should I not love her, Harry? I do love her. She is everything to me in life. Night after night, I go to see her play. One evening she is Rosalind, and the next evening she is Imogen. I've seen her die in the gloom of an Italian tomb, sucking the poison from her lover's lips. I have watched her wandering through the forest of Arden, disguised as a pretty boy in hose and doublet and a dainty cap. She has been mad, and has come into the presence of a guilty king, and given him rue to wear and bitter herbs to taste of. She has been innocent, and the black hands of jealousy have crushed her reed-like throat. I have seen her in every age and in every costume. Ordinary women never appeal to one's imagination. They are limited to their century. No glamour ever transfigures them. One knows their minds as easily as one knows their bonnets. One can always find them. There is no mystery in any of them. They ride in the park in the morning and chatter at tea parties in the afternoon. They have their stereotyped smile and their fashionable manner. They are quite obvious. But an actress... How different an actress is, Harry. Why didn't you tell me that the only thing worth loving is an actress? Because I have loved so many of them, Dorian. Oh, yes, horrid people with dyed hair and painted faces. Don't run down dyed hair and painted faces. There is an extraordinary charm in them sometimes, said Lord Henry. I wish now I had not told you about Sybil Vane. You could not have helped telling me, Dorian. All through your life you will tell me everything you do. 
Yes, Harry, I believe that is true. I cannot help telling you things. You have a curious influence over me. If I ever did a crime, I would come and confess it to you. You would understand me. People like you, the willful sunbeams of life, don't commit crimes, Dorian. But I am much obliged for the compliment all the same. And now tell me, reach me the matches like a good boy. Thanks. What are your actual relations with Sybil Vane? Dorian Gray leaps to his feet with flushed cheeks and burning eyes. Harry, Sybil Vane is sacred. It is only the sacred things that are worth touching, Dorian, said Lord Henry with a strange touch of pathos in his voice. But why should you be annoyed? I suppose she will belong to you some day. When one is in love, one always begins by deceiving oneself and one always ends by deceiving others. That is what the world calls a romance. You know her at any rate, I suppose. Of course I know her. On the first night I was at the theatre, the horrid owner came round to the box after the performance was over and offered to take me behind the scenes and introduce me to her. I was furious with him and told him that Juliet had been dead for hundreds of years and that her body was lying in a marble tomb in Verona. I think from his blank look of amazement and he was under the impression that I had taken too much champagne or something. I'm not surprised. Then he asked me if I wrote for any of the newspapers. I told him I never even read them. He seemed terribly disappointed at that, and confided to me that all the dramatic critics were in a conspiracy against him, and that they were every one of them to be bought. I should not wonder if he was quite right there, but on the other hand, judging from their appearances, most of them cannot be at all expensive. Well, he seemed to think they were beyond his means, laughed Dorian. By this time, however, the lights were being put on in the theatre and I had to go. He wanted me to try some cigars that he strongly recommended. I declined. The next night, of course, I arrived at the place again. When he saw me, he made a low bow and assured me that I was a munificent patron of art. He was a most offensive brute, though he had an extraordinary passion for Shakespeare. He told me once, with an air of pride, that his five bankruptcies were entirely due to the bard, as he insisted on calling him. He seemed to think it a distinction. It is a distinction, my dear Dorian, a great distinction. Most people become bankrupt through having invested too heavily in the prose of life. To have ruined oneself over poetry is an honour. But when did you first speak to Miss Sybil Vane? The third night. She had been playing Rosalind. I could not help go round. I had thrown her some flowers and she had looked at me. At least I fancied that she had. The old man was persistent. He seemed determined to take me behind, so I consented. It was curious, my not wanting to know her, wasn't it? No, I don't think so. My dear Harry, why? I um, will tell you some other time. Now I want to know about the girl. Sybil? Oh, she was so shy and so gentle. There is something of a child about her. Her eyes opened wide in exquisite wonder when I told her what I thought of her performance, and she seemed quite unconscious of her power. I think we were both rather nervous. The old man stood grinning at the doorway of the dusty green room, making elaborate speeches about us both, while we stood looking at each other like children. He would insist on calling me my lord, so I had to assure Sybil that I was not anything of the kind. She said quite simply to me, You look more like a prince. I must call you Prince Charming. Upon my word, Dorian, Miss Sybil knows how to pay compliments. You don't understand her, Harry. She regarded me merely as a person in a play. She knows nothing of life. She lives with her mother, a faded, tired woman who played Lady Capulet in a sort of magenta dressing wrapper on the first night, and looks as if she has seen better days. I know that look. It depresses me, murmured Lord Henry, examining his rings. The old man wanted to tell me her history, but I said it did not interest me. You are quite right. There is always something infinitely mean about other people's tragedies. Sybil is the only thing I care about. What is it to me where she came from? From her little head to her little feet, she is absolutely and entirely divine. Every night of my life I go to see her act, and every night she is more marvellous. That is the reason, I suppose, that you never dine with me now. I thought you must have some curious romance on hand. You have— but it is not quite what I expected. My dear Harry, we either lunch or sup together every day, and I have been to the opera with you several times, said Dorian, opening his blue eyes in wonder. You always come dreadfully late. Well, I can't help going to see Sybil play, he cried, even if it is only for a single act. I get hungry for her presence, and when I think of the wonderful soul that is hidden away in that little ivory body, I am filled with awe. You can dine with me tonight, Dorian, can't you? He shook his head. Tonight she is Imogen, and tomorrow night she will be Juliet. 
When is she Sybil Vane? Never. I congratulate you. How horrid you are. She is all the great heroines of the world in one. She is more than an individual. You laugh, but I tell you, she has genius. I love her, and I must make her love me. You, you who know the secrets of life, tell me how to charm Sybil Vane to love me. I want to make Romeo jealous. I want the dead lovers of the world to hear our laughter and grow sad. I want a breath of our passion to stir their dust into consciousness, to wake their ashes into pain. My God, Harry, how I worship her. He was walking up and down the room as he spoke. Hectic spots of red burned on his cheeks. He was terribly excited. Lord Henry watched him with a subtle sense of pleasure. How different he was now from the shy, frightened boy he had met in Basil Hallward's studio. His nature had developed like a flower, had borne blossoms of scarlet flame. Out of its secret hiding place had crept his soul, and desire had come to meet it on the way. "'And what do you propose to do?' said Lord Henry at last. I want you and Basil to come with me some night and see her act. I have not the slightest fear of the result. You are certain to acknowledge her genius. Then we must get her out of that old man's hands. She is bound to him for three years, at least for two years and eight months from the present time. I shall have to pay him something, of course. When all of that is settled, I shall take a West End theatre and bring her out properly. She will make the world as mad as she has made me. That would be impossible, my dear boy. Yes, she will. She has not merely art, consummate art instinct in her, but she has personality also, and you have often told me that it is personalities, not principles, that move the age. Well, what night shall we go? Let me see. Today is Tuesday. Let us fix tomorrow. She plays Juliet tomorrow. All right. The Bristol at eight o'clock, and I will get Basil. Not eight, Harry, please. Half past six. We must be there before the curtain rises. You must see her in the first act where she meets Romeo. Half past six? What an hour! It will be like having meat tea or reading an English novel. It must be seven. No gentleman dines before seven. Shall you see Basil between this and then, or shall I write to him? Dear Basil, I have not laid eyes on him for a week. It is rather horrid of me, as he has sent me my portrait in the most wonderful frame, specially designed by himself, and though I am a little jealous of the picture for being a whole month younger than I am, I must admit that I delight in it. Perhaps you had better write to him. I don't want to see him alone. He says things that annoy me. He gives me good advice. Lord Henry smiled. People are very fond of giving away what they need most themselves. It is what I call the depth of generosity. Oh, Basil is the best of fellows, but he seems to be just a bit of a philistine. Since I have known you, Harry, I have discovered that. Basil, my dear boy, puts everything that is charming in him into his work. The consequence is that he has nothing left for life but his prejudices, his principles, and his common sense. The only artists I have ever known who are personally delightful are bad artists. Good artists exist simply in what they make, and consequently are perfectly uninteresting in what they are. A great poet, a really great poet, is the most unpoetical of all creatures, but inferior poets are absolutely fascinating. The worse their rhymes are, the more picturesque they look. The mere fact of having published a book of second-rate sonnets makes a man quite irresistible. He lives the poetry that he cannot write. The others write the poetry that they dare not realise. "'I wonder is that really so, Harry?' said Dorian Gray, putting some perfume on his handkerchief out of a large gold-topped bottle that stood on the table. "'It must be, if you say it. And now I am off. Imogen is waiting for me. Don't forget about tomorrow. Goodbye.' As he left the room, Lord Henry's heavy eyelids drooped, and he began to think. Certainly few people had ever interested him so much as Dorian Gray, and yet the lad's mad adoration of someone else caused him not the slightest pang of annoyance or jealousy. He was pleased by it. It made him a more interesting study. He had been always enthralled by the methods of natural science, but the ordinary subject matter of that science had seemed to him trivial and of no import. And so he had begun by vivisecting himself, as he had ended by vivisecting others. Human life, that appeared to him to be the one thing worth investigating. 
Compared to it, there was nothing else of any value. It was true that as one watched life in its curious crucible of pain and pleasure, one could not wear over one's face a mask of glass, nor keep the sulfurous fumes from troubling the brain and making the imagination turbid with monstrous fancies and misshapen dreams. There were poisons so subtle that to know their properties one had to sicken of them. There were maladies so strange that one had to pass through them if one sought to understand their nature. And yet, what a great reward one received! How wonderful the whole world became to one! To note the curious, hard logic of passion and the emotional, coloured life of the intellect, to observe where they met and where they separated, at what point they were in unison and at what point they were at discord, there was a delight in that. What matter what the cost was, one could never pay too high a price for any sensation. He was conscious, and the thought brought a gleam of pleasure into his brown eyes, that it was through certain words of his, musical words said with a musical utterance, that Dorian Gray's soul had turned to this girl and bowed in worship before her. To a large extent the lad was his own creation, he had made him premature. That was something. Ordinary people waited till life disclosed to them its secrets, but to the few, to the elect, the mysteries of life were revealed before the veil was drawn away. Sometimes this was the effect of art, and chiefly the art of literature, which dealt immediately with the passions and the intellect. But now and then a complex personality took the place and assumed the office of art, and was indeed in its way a real work of art, life having its elaborate masterpieces just as poetry has, or sculpture, or painting. Yes, the lad was premature. He was gathering his harvest while it was not yet spring. The pulse and passion of youth were in him, but he was becoming self-conscious. It was delightful to watch him. With his beautiful face and his beautiful soul, he was a thing to wonder at. It was no matter how it all ended or was destined to end. He was like one of those gracious figures in a pageant or a play whose joys seem to be remote from one, but whose sorrows stir one's sense of beauty and whose wounds are like red roses. Soul and body, body and soul. How mysterious they were. There was animalism in the soul, and the body had its moments of spirituality. The senses could refine and the intellect could degrade. Who could say where the fleshly impulse ceased or the physical impulse began? How shallow were the arbitrary definitions of ordinary psychologists, and yet how difficult to decide between the claims of the various schools? Was the soul a shadow seated in the house of sin, or was the body really in the soul, as Giordano Bruno thought? The separation of spirit from matter was a mystery, and the union of spirit with matter was a mystery also. He began to wonder whether we could ever make psychology so absolute a science that each little spring of life would be revealed to us. As it was, we always misunderstand ourselves, and rarely understood others. Experience was of no ethical value, it was merely the name men gave to their mistakes. Moralists had, as a rule, regarded it as a mode of warning, had claimed for it a certain ethical efficacy in the formation of character, had praised it as something that taught us what to follow and showed us what to avoid. But there was no motive power in experience. It was as little of an active cause as conscience itself. All that it really demonstrated was that our future would be the same as our past, and that the sin we had done once, and with loathing, we would do many times, and with joy. It was clear to him that the experimental method was the only method by which one could arrive at any scientific analysis of the passions, and certainly Dorian Gray was a subject made to his hand, and seemed to promise rich and fruitful results. His sudden mad love for Sybil Vane was a psychological phenomenon of no small interest. There was no doubt that curiosity had much to do with it, curiosity and the desire for new experiences, yet it was not a simple but rather a very complex passion. What there was in it of the purely sensuous instinct of boyhood had been transformed by the workings of the imagination, changed into something that seemed to the lad himself to be remote from sense, and was for that very reason all the more dangerous. It was the passions about whose origin we deceived ourselves that tyrannised most strongly over us. Our weakest motives were those of whose nature we were conscious. 
It often happened that when we thought we were experimenting on others, we were really experimenting on ourselves. While Lord Henry sat dreaming on these thoughts, a knock came to the door, and his valet entered and reminded him that it was time to dress for dinner. He got up and looked out into the street. The sunset had smitten into scarlet gold the upper windows of the houses opposite. The panes glowed like plates of heated metal. The sky above was like a faded rose. He thought of his friend's young, fiery-coloured life and wondered how it was all going to end. When he arrived home, about half-past twelve o'clock, he saw a telegram lying on the hall table. He opened it and found it was from Dorian Gray. It was to tell him that he was engaged to be married to Sybil Vane. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part three of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. If you did, then please consider supporting The Well Told Tale on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with part four of this classic story. I hope you can join me. <laughs>